Hi, today's Archeonomy video is about an event and place that will be familiar to any of my viewers from Australia, and probably completely unknown to everybody else. I encountered it in my research tracking the movements of the British military regiments that served in New Zealand. The event in question is known as the Eureka Rebellion, and the place is the Eureka Stockade, located in Ballarat, Victoria, Australia. Uh, no, this has nothing to do with Archimedes playing a badge in his bathtub. In this video, first I'll discuss the Eureka Rebellion to explain what it was, then I'll look at some of the archaeological work done there, and finish up with the links that can be drawn to New Zealand that led me to want to learn about it in the first place. In 1851, gold was discovered in Victoria, and the resulting gold rush saw thousands of people from all walks of life just drop everything, abandon their jobs without warning, and go seek their fortunes in the gold fields. As news got out, people from around the world converged on Australia. Having thousands of people deserting their positions in farms, trades, even the police, put the economy of Victoria under incredible pressure. As a means to generate some revenue, but more importantly create disincentive for people to just drop everything and run off to the goldfields, the Victorian government copied New South Wales and introduced the requirement for a mining licence, initially costing 30 shillings, granting the right for a miner to extract gold for 30 days. This cost needed to be paid up front, and how much gold you found, if any, was irrelevant. Gold commissioners were appointed to each gold field, and they used their police forces to issue and enforce the license requirement. Little kings of their little domains. At first, they also tried to enforce prohibition on the gold fields as well, and surprise, surprise, this resulted in lemonade tents being established that sold grog on the sly. The system was fatally flawed, and corruption was rife. By early 1854, the authorities realised prohibition was just not going to work and began to issue liquor licences to hotels. One such licence was issued to James Bentley, owner of the Eureka Hotel. The diggers were not well pleased by the taxation or corruption in the least, but at first around 80% of the diggers just paid their licence fees and carried on mining. Those caught without licences could be fined £10, sent to jail in Melbourne or Geelong, or had to forfeit their claims. Did these thousands of diggers have a say in all this? No. And this is an important factor to understand. At that point in time, voting rights were hardly universal in Australia, and women's suffrage was a long way off. In order to qualify to vote, you had to be an adult male who owned or rented property of a certain value. In the first Victorian election, there were 10,000 eligible voters of a population of 29,000 adult males. What this boils down to is that the diggers are in a situation of taxation without representation. Sound familiar to any American viewers out there? The Eureka lead was a discovery that deep under the clay layer was an ancient riverbed with underground flowing water that had deposited considerable amounts of gold in its bends. This deep lead was 31 to 46 metres down, too much for a single miner to access, given the danger of flooding. The diggers had to pool their resources and claims and work together in teams to share the work and the rewards. It sometimes took up to six months to dig a productive shaft. The more time-consuming digging meant that the diggers were settling in for the long haul, and many of them brought their wives and families out to live with them. People from many countries gathered in these gold fields, often working with their fellow countrymen. Some were veterans of the Californian gold fields, others were totally new to mining. The majority were from Britain, quite a few were Irish, many of them middle class, as the poor could not afford the passage down under. Others from Germany, France, Italy, Switzerland and North America came. The Chinese would come to the gold fields later on once the Eureka Rebellion was over. The authorities were particularly concerned about the Americans and the Irish, that they may stir up republican or rebellious sentiment in the diggers. The situation gradually escalated. By the end of 1851, the licence fee had been doubled to £3. In June 1854, a new Lieutenant Governor, Sir Charles Hotham, arrived. But he ignored the petitions of the miners just as much as his predecessor did. By mid-1854, only around 50% of the miners were buying licences. The remainder refused to pay. This all came to a head when a young Scottish miner named James Scobie was murdered in the street with a shovel. At the direction of James Bentley, the hotel owner for insulting his wife. Bentley's contacts in the town meant that the deposition was an utter farce, and he was let go. A mob of angry diggers marched on the Eureka Hotel and pelted the resident commissioner, Robert Reed, with eggs and set the place on fire. 
Reed arrested some of the diggers to make examples of them, but Hotham ordered an inquiry into this kangaroo court of a deposition. Kangaroo? Because it's Australia? Mm, Never mind. Thousands of diggers gathered on Bakery Hill, and the Diggers Reform Society was formed to peacefully petition Hotham for reform. Hotham ordered the arrest of the Bentleys, and they fled for Melbourne. In vain, as they were arrested there, tried and found guilty of manslaughter, rather than murder, and were sentenced to three years' hard labour. The Diggers Reform Society became the Ballarat Reform League, and the Welshman John Basson Humphrey was elected president. They petitioned Hotham, demanding removal of the property requirements for voting, and most of all, no taxation without representation. Hotham and Reed saw this as a fermenting rebellion, and military reinforcements were brought into Ballarat. Hundreds of troops, pretty much every soldier that Melbourne could supply. The Redcoats, marching into Ballarat with bayonets fixed, incensed some of the diggers, and they attacked a detachment of the 12th Regiment, escorting wagons of ammunition. The wagons were overturned, a drummer boy was wounded, and the injured boy found himself used in propaganda against the diggers. Humphrey's demands had been completely ignored, and frequent license checks by armed police, now escorted by soldiers, were seriously aggravating the diggers. On the 29th of November, at a meeting of over 10,000 diggers, the Southern Cross flag was unfurled. Humphrey's non-violent methods were given up on, and a new leader, Peter Laylor, spoke up. He saw that the diggers would need to defend themselves. Some diggers burned their licenses at the event. There was a license hunt the very next day, and the police and soldiers were pelted with projectiles, stones, bottles, whatever was at hand. Reed read the riot act to them, and both sides opened fire. One policeman and one digger were wounded, and eight diggers were arrested. Immediately following this debacle, another huge meeting was held on Bakery Hill. Layla was elected leader, and his friend Raffaello Caboni his second-in-command. The group swore the oath, We swear by the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other, and fight to defend our rights and liberties. The diggers armed themselves, with guns if possible, but also made makeshift pikes, and shifted from Bakery Hill to the Eureka Lead, where they started to cobble together a ramshackle stockade about an acre in size from slabs of timber and earth. Miners' shepherds' holds inside the stockade were turned to rifle pits. They also drilled and trained with their weapons. Laylor still wanted to avoid violence, if at all possible, and sent a deputation to Reed to try and prevent bloodshed, offering to lay down arms if the commissioner suspended license hunts and released the imprisoned diggers. Reed would have none of it. At midnight, on Saturday the 2nd of December 1854, there were only 120 diggers inside the stockade, with about 100 guns and enough ammunition to fire each gun once or twice. At 2.30am on the 3rd of December, 182 troops, some mounted, some on foot, with 92 police, advanced on the stockade. They had been ordered to shoot any digger who offered resistance. The force did not advance straight at the stockade. They left the rear of their camp, followed Yarrowy Creek to Black Hill, and approached the stockade without being seen. They weren't spotted until they were about 150 metres away. A bugle was sounded and the troops rushed in, fanning out to surround it as best as possible. The battle was short and predictably one-sided. Well-trained and well-armed troops charged and gunned down the poorly equipped, untrained miners in a poorly made stockade. Four soldiers and between 22 and 60 diggers were killed, and 125 diggers taken prisoner. Peter Layla was shot in the arm and lost it as a result, but managed to escape being captured. This brutal crackdown would have far-reaching consequences. One of the prisoners, Henry Seacamp, was jailed for three months for sedition, but all the rest were acquitted paraded through the streets in triumph. The authorities looked like complete villains in the eyes of the public. The Commission on the Goldfields came back with the recommendations that the license system be abolished and replaced with a £1 per year miners' right that also granted voting rights, and an export duty on the gold be applied instead. The Legislative Council would be expanded by 12 seats, eight of which would be elected by the diggers. The two representatives elected for Ballarat were Humphrey and Laylor. With the passing of the Goldfields Act in 1855, local courts were established with elected members to deal with disputes. Hotham tendered his resignation, and Reed transferred out of the district out of fear for his safety. In 1857, voting rights were extended to all British and Aborigine males 21 years or over. The landscape at Eureka has changed dramatically since the gold mining days, and the exact site of the stockade is debated. 
1856, the Eureka lead was mined out using the methods available to the diggers, so most of them moved on. Chinese miners moved in to replace them, panning the debris left behind by the original diggers. During the 1860s, mining companies came in with resources to crush the surface debris and dig even deeper leads. Also, the cement companies worked over a large area, but had to abandon it for the same reason the diggers had difficulty, large amounts of groundwater. The area was gazetted the reserve in 1870 and landscaped into a public park. A monument was erected to commemorate the events of the stockade in 1884. Other features were added in the 20th century, an artificial lake, children's playground, Olympic swimming pool, even a replica Eureka stockade, which has now been removed. And in the late 1990s, a visitor's centre. The construction of this visitor's centre required archaeological monitoring, and as a result, there's an archaeological report to look at. Thanks to Heritage Victoria's Grey Literature Library, I have a copy of the 1998 excavation report of the Eureka Precinct by Dr Vincent Clark. Clark excavated test trenches and monitored the motor scrapers shifting around the soil for the construction of the visitor's centre. These earthworks allowed Clark to reconstruct the landforms from the 1850s, which are quite different to today's surface. Mining features such as shepherd holes and two shafts were encountered, infilled with spoil and rubbish from the mining era. The sort of artefacts that recovered from the time of the Eureka Rebellion included black beer and case gin bottles. Some of the black beers with the tops removed by sabotage. Stoneware ginger beer bottles and fragments of glass soft drink bottles suggest that some drinks that weren't hard liquor were being sold at the lemonade tents. Just, you know, not a whole lot. The vast majority of glass fragments were from liquor bottles. One digger who cut himself on the broken glass scattered around Eureka bled to death while in custody for want of medical treatment, so the large amounts of broken glass found amongst the mining debris was representative of the place at the time. Typical mid-19th century domestic ceramics were found, a reminder that these people were living where they worked, often with their families, enduring horrible conditions for that chance of finding a fortune. Chinese ceramics were found in many of the areas, the same forms found here in New Zealand on Chinese sites. Many of them were Nka pea bottles, a type of hard liquor. A pepper box revolver was found in the fill of one of the mine shafts. The rusty relic was x-rayed, which revealed that one of the springs in the firing mechanism had broken, providing a possible reason why it was discarded. Though one has to wonder why the owner didn't have the spring replaced. There are different theories posed as to the exact location of the Eureka stockade, a puzzle made difficult due to the huge changes in the landform that have occurred. It's long been considered that the archaeology would be little help due to the amount of disturbance in the area. The excavations for the car park extended into the area said by some to be the location of the stockade, but found no evidence of mining features there at all, eliminating it as a possibility. Clark came to the conclusion that based on the historic topography, the stockade was probably located at or near the 1884 monument, as stated by Harvey in 1994. I do not know if more recent studies have disproven or confirmed this, and I haven't found anything that does. But I'm working a distance here, and I'm not familiar with the historic research resources of Victoria. So how does this rebellion at a Victorian goldfield relate to New Zealand, some 2,000 kilometres away? New Zealand maintained a property qualification for voting until 1879, although the Central Otago Gold Rush in 1861 saw a miner's right to vote introduced in 1862 and better representation for the sudden change in population density. This gold rush saw thousands of diggers crossing the Tasman to seek their fortunes in Otago. The mining population reached its zenith in 1864. I'm not sure of the connection here, but there was a Eureka gold mine in Otago. I cannot be sure of a direct link, though, as the term Eureka is associated with gold mining in general. Something else of importance was going on in New Zealand in the 1860s, the New Zealand Wars. The colonial government intended to confiscate vast swathes of Māori land and needed armed settlers to occupy it. Their cunning plan was to send officials to goldfields and recruit diggers with the lure of free land for them and their families. They were able to find some recruits in Otago, but nowhere near enough for what they had planned. They had a little success recruiting in Sydney, but in Melbourne they were able to recruit large numbers of Victorian diggers. By the 6th of October 1863, they'd recruited two Waikato militia regiments of a thousand men each, and were in the process of forming another at 370. This was not the end of the process, only the beginning. Four Waikato militia regiments would be raised in total, and other military settlers would be recruited for Taranaki and elsewhere. Every soldier would be rewarded with a one-acre town section, 
and a farm section varying in size depending on their rank. Privates would get 50 acres, sergeants 80 acres, and captains 300 acres, for example. So, these military settlements were established and the former diggers and their families lived happily ever after, right? Uh, no. The officers, with their large land allotments, also got first pick, and inevitably took all the best land. So a digger and their family, keen to start a new life, could arrive on their farm allotment to find it's a fetid swamp. Even if it was decent land, many of the military settlers knew absolutely nothing about farming. Also, the New Zealand government, which was in atrocious amounts of debt, didn't provide any support for these new settlements. Here's your block of land, there's your town redoubt, away you go. By 1867, only 10% of the Taranaki military settlers were still occupying their land. Many of the surveyed out new towns didn't have a single building on them. That being said, many towns in the Waikato and Taranaki do trace their origins back to the former diggers of the military settlers. The British troops who stormed the stockade at Eureka, the 12th East Suffolk Regiment and the 40th 2nd Somersetshire Regiment, were both brought over to campaign in New Zealand. Both regiments served in the Waikato campaign, right alongside the diggers in the Waikato militias. I'm genuinely impressed with the importance that the Eureka Rebellion and the gold mining era in general is given in Australia. Not only is there a big visitor centre on site, there's a 91-storey skyscraper in Melbourne named after it and modelled after the Southern Cross flag. There have been five films, two stage musicals, a play and a miniseries made about it. The Eureka Rebellion is a real part of Australian culture. A couple of kilometres southwest of Eureka is Sovereign Hill an open-air museum devoted to the mining era, and one of Ballarat's biggest tourist attractions. They'll do a light and sound show at night called Blood on the Southern Cross, telling the Eureka story. Well done, Australia. Well played. If only New Zealand embraced its history half as much as you do. The history of the Eureka Rebellion is a tale of ambition and optimism, greed and corruption, and ultimately, the heavy-handed, violent methods of authoritarians ultimately failing against the will of the people. It's tragic that so many had to die for real change to be made. This is a complex topic, and this is a long video. I've not been able to go into anywhere near as much detail as I'd like, but hopefully I've provided an introduction to those of you who've never heard of it before. And you can seek out the details yourselves if you're interested. I've put a link to Carboni's personal account on Project Gutenberg into the description. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers.